Good day to you all. My name is Una Popovic. I come from Serbia. I am an assistant professor at the uh, Department of Philosophy, Faculty of Philosophy, University of Novi Sad in Serbia. And I'm making this video as a guest lecture on the course on philosophy of art uh, for the MA students of the students uh, for the MA students of the University of Porto. Uh, Vitor Guerreiro was kind enough to ask me to participate in his course to uh, make this presentation and he was also kind enough to suggest the topic of my presentation which will be Byzantine aesthetics, so medieval Byzantine aesthetics and uh, philosophy of art more precisely, that is I will focus today on uh, the theory of icon. Uh, I wish to say thank you to Vitor for inviting me. I'm very happy to participate in this course and I believe that this was a wonderful idea of uh, bringing us all together in these troublesome times uh, using online presentations. So Vitor, thank you again for all your efforts. Uh, when it comes to Byzantine aesthetics, uh, there are two main points uh, of interest of Byzantine philosophers, and uh, I would like to start with that. So the first one, and chronologically the first one, was the theory of beauty, uh, which had uh, a lot of Platonic influences and which uh, was significantly uh, metaphysically um, taught and presented. And the other one, the one we will going to uh, present today, uh, is the theory of art and especially a theory of uh, painting, that is, of images and uh, of icon. Uh, the most famous and most known part of Byzantine aesthetics is, of course, the iconoclastic movement, uh, which took place between 726 AD and 8043 AD. So this iconoclastic movement was uh, against the use of icons in Christian worship, so against the worship of icons in uh, Christian practices, and uh, it, not, was, it was not just the iconoclastic movement, but it also was a debate between those who were against, so iconoclasts, and those who were uh, pro- uh, icons and uh, icon worship, uh, which are called iconodulists. So this debate between iconoclasts and iconodulists took place for more than 100 years uh, in the Byzantine Empire, and it really shaped uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, theology, as well as Byzantine philosophy and aesthetics, as well as artistic practices and even uh, everyday life of uh, an ordinary person. So it really had a, a significant impact on every single aspect of uh, Byzantine culture of the time and it gave it a shape. Also, this debate influenced uh, largely the way icons are treated after this period. So, both in during the rest of remaining part of Byzantine Empire and uh, in terms of years, and also in uh, Eastern Orthodox theology uh, by by today, so till the till uh, till the present time, and uh, the entire thing started uh, for. Formally, in 1726, when uh, Byzantine Empire Leo III issued the famous decree uh, banning icon worship uh, in Byzantine Empire. So, uh, according to this decree, it was forbidden to make or worship icons uh, since that uh, since that time on. Also, uh, there was a council, a famous iconoclast council, uh, which took place in Constantinople in 1740, uh, 1754 AD, uh, gathering uh, some 388 uh, participants, so bishops, episcopes, 
and uh, they uh, were against worship of icons. They even um, concluded that the Patriarch and uh, Saint John of Damascus should be excommunicated from the church because of their, um, their because they were uh, pro worshipping of icons. So more or less uh, we can concentrate on uh, their positions uh, of the position of the iconoclast according to this iconoclastic council. Uh, the entire uh, debate was um, formally ended uh, in 8th century in uh, 1787 when uh, another council, uh, Seventh Ecumenal Council, or the Second Council in Nicaea took place, and uh, this council rejected the iconoclastic council and also rejected uh, the uh, the condemnation of uh, icon worship. So it made legal again to make and worship icons in Byzantine Empire. So we are more or less going to go. Uh, back and forth between these these uh, two councils and uh, see what uh, iconoclasts and iconodulists had to say about uh, the art. Uh, what I wish to present you with today are these two separate, different and rivaling uh, theories of icon and of visual arts in Byzantine Empire. Uh, what I don't want to do today is to go into the arguments and counter arguments of uh, iconoclasts and iconodulists because uh, that would require uh, an entire course, not just one lecture, and also that would require uh, a more precise and uh, deeper knowledge of uh, Eastern Church theology, which is of course the background of this entire issue. So uh, instead of that, I would rather uh, consider the entire debate as a matter of two clashing uh, aesthetical and theological, of course, theories about image, about icon. So I will present them as such. Uh, well, let's start with uh, the word term. So uh, the term icon uh, is, in my opinion, uh, best to be translated in English with uh, the term image, uh, as I already did sort of use the term image before. And uh, although the term image does not cover all the uh, meanings of the term icon, it's the best uh, uh, the best choice we can make because it uh, it refers to something rather uh, rather common for Byzantine view on icons and that is a metaphysical and theological background I already mentioned. Uh, so uh, when I say uh, image I mean uh, imago dei and this is the cue we can use to understand icons and the theory of icon in Byzantine Empire a bit better. So in Latin and in Eastern tradition, uh, in Orthodox and as well as in Catholic tradition, uh, the human being is considered to be an image of God. So uh, imago Dei or a uh, human being also is considered to be an icon of God. And uh, when we say that, we use the term icon or image in the metaphysical uh, in a metaphysical context, metaphysically theological context. So uh, we are not using it specifically for the work of art, for uh, a specific, uh, let's say, painting or fresco or picture uh, painted by an artist, but we are using it to define human nature. And uh, this is something which defines this kind of thinking about icons, uh, defined Byzantine aesthetics and Byzantine philosophy, from the early ages on, so even before this iconoclastic movement and the debate that uh, followed after the for after the uh, 
decree of the Emperor Leo III. So uh, the point here is that uh, even in the early ages of Christianity, uh, the issue of icon or the issue of image was theoretically important uh, exactly because it was related to uh, metaphysical um, structure and metaphysical understanding of uh, reality. Uh, not only a human being is an icon or uh, imago dei, uh, but also in these metaphysical terms, uh, um, in metaphysical context, uh, icon was used to define, to describe relations between uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that the Son uh, was considered to be an icon of uh, the icon of the God, uh, Godfather. Uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was considered to be the icon of the sun. Also, a third possibility to use this notion uh, in metaphysical terms was uh, to use it to refer to an image, to an icon, to a concept of the created world in the mind of God. So we have three possibilities, all of which are metaphysical and none of which is directly related to the work of art, uh, that is to the icon as the work of art. The first one is the relations between, uh, refers to rela relations between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The second one uh, refers to the nature of human being, um, the physical nature of human being, and the third one refers to the concept of the created world in the uh, mind of God. And these three possibilities were developed and uh, they define uh, early Byzantine theory of image of icon uh, up until this iconoclastic movement up until the 7th century, 7th and 8th century AD, when uh, the focus shifted from the metaphysical issues to the work of art. So with the iconoclastic movement, we have uh, specific theories to iconoclastic and iconodulist theories who uh, concentrate specifically on works of art and uh, move the debate concerning the uh, nature of image, the nature of uh, icon, uh, on, on the works of art. This, of course, does not mean that the metaphysical concepts and metaphysical categories I've uh, just described uh, were dismissed. Uh, on the contrary, they were much present in this debate between iconoclasts and iconodulists, but uh, they were not the focus of the debate. The focus of the debate was artistic practice of painting icons and the role of such painted icons in the Christian worship and in cultural life of uh, Byzantine uh, society of the time. So the point was this shift towards artistic issues, uh, although uh, the shift was not entirely uh, dedicated to arts as such, uh, regardless of other problems like these metaphysical and theological ones, it was in fact significant movement in terms of aesthetics. So uh, I will just briefly uh, try to uh, sketch the positions of both parties, of both uh, iconodulists and iconoclasts, and uh, try to show you uh, how do they understand this uh, work of art, which is painting, and uh, of course, uh, frescoes and icons. So another issue I have to mention here, uh, apart from these metaphysical concerns uh, about the term icon, is that the term refers equally to paintings and frescoes so both of those are uh, when we speak about the icon uh, in terms of work of art uh, we speak both of frescoes and icons strict sense so um, also the metaphysical theories uh, concerning uh, the icons I've described before uh, are to be found in early church fathers philosophies uh, for example and especially in Alexandria uh, for example in in uh, or of Alexandria, Clement of Alexandria, even in Philo of Alexandria. So, um, 
the very debate between iconoclasts and iconodulists, as I said, uh, formally began with the decree of the Emperor Leo III, but uh, actually, and more significantly, uh, it was kind of prepared before uh, in 60, uh, 692, uh, when another church council took place uh, in uh, Constantinople, and this was the uh, fifth and sixth ecumenal council, so the two councils were held at the same time. And uh, this council is important because it, uh, in two of uh, principles, it advocates for, so in two of, it, of the conclusions uh, participants uh, uh, finally made, uh, it refers directly to works of art and to art practices. practices. Moreover, it uh, tries and it uh, sort of demands for the change in the way we make and understand and use the icons. So uh, this uh, fifth and sixth ecumenal council in Constantinople, uh, so-called Trulon Council in Trullo uh, Council, uh, was actually the, the starting point of the debate and the starting point for both iconoclasts and iconodulists uh, because it uh, it bring brought change uh, um, com in comparison to what uh, was the usual practice practice of making icons uh, in tradition of uh, Eastern Orthodox Church and Byzantine Empire. Uh, first of all, there were two, two main points I would like to address here when it comes to this uh, Trulon Council. Uh, first of all, uh, Trulon Council really made a, a, an issue of the paintings at the time, any paintings, including icons and religious objects. Uh, so before that, uh, the, the, the entire issue of painting was more or less free. One could uh, paint icons or just uh, continue practices of painting uh, which um, which were present in ancient society also, but uh, in Trulon Council, uh, the uh, paint, painting was more or less uh, reserved for the religious purposes. So uh, it was um, uh, it it was strongly suggested that artists should not make any secular painting, so that is painting with secular content, and that uh, painting should be uh, only about uh, some Christian uh, motives, some Christian issues, some Christian uh, doctrines. So this was the first main point, and uh, although this, from today's perspective, this may seem uh, somewhat conservative and uh, perhaps diminishing for the art, it was just the opposite. Uh, at the time, it it really uh, helped uh, painting and arts to elevate and get uh, be considered more, more worthy in the Byzantine Empire. Another important issue of the Trellon Council was that uh, the very practice of painting was changed so that uh, it was suggested icons should be painted in anthropomorphical forms as we know them today. So uh, the practice before Trellon Council was more uh, into symbolical and allegorical presentations. For example, uh, if you would want to uh, make an icon of Christ, you would probably paint a lamb and not uh, a Christ in some kind of human form, because as Christians we are all familiar with that a lamb symbolizes Christ, uh, much similar to the practices of uh, early, early Christianity when it was uh, still outlawed in the Roman Empire, when uh, Christians used to uh, declare themselves as Christians using the uh, image of a fish uh, as uh, making them all known to those who know the meaning of this symbol that they are Christian. So this has roots in uh, very early ages of Christianity and this kind of 
tradition, this kind of traditional practice was now abandoned uh, from, according to the church fathers of the trial and council, in favor of anthropomorphical representations of Christ and saints. So this was the, uh, the point of uh, importance because exactly this anthropomorphical representation of Christ was at the heart of the debate between iconoclast and iconodulist. The problem was uh, how can we use, or, or better to say, uh, should we use painted images of Christ to represent Christ? Hi, that was my cat. Sorry. This is my cat, Puffy. Sorry about that. So uh, the problem was the image of Christ himself. The problem was never uh, is there any possibility uh, of making an icon of the Father. It was only about the Son and whatever follows in terms of saints. So both iconoclasts and iconodulists uh, were on the same page regarding the father so because the father that is god as such is of spiritual nature because god is spirit he has no body he is not material uh, there is no possibility whatsoever to make any kind of image of uh, God as Father and uh, God as such, and uh, on that issue they were on the same page. But the problem was the representation of Christ, the Son, because as we all know, Christ took a human form, and by taking human form, it seems that this, this made kind of a problem. So, uh, is that a possibility for us to? Uh, make an icon, make, an, make a painting of Christ as such by painting his obviously human anthropomorphic and material form. This was the heart of the issue if we look at it in terms of in terms of theology and also in terms of aesthetics to, to put the thing more uh, in contemporary terms. The issue here is uh, whether a painting can present something which is not material as such. That is, uh, whether a material object of any sort, especially artistic material object, could be used to uh, communicate, to represent, uh, to manifest, to exemplify, whatever you wish, uh, something which is not material as such. Or to put it more, even more con in contemporary terms, uh, can we or should we uh, consider a work of art as something uh, to be reduced only uh, um, on its formal uh, uh, characteristics on its formal uh, and sensibly by senses acquirable uh, characteristics or are these just a way just a medium for us to communicate something which cannot actually be seen or heard in these terms i believe that uh iconoclastic movement and the debate between iconoclasts and iconodulists can be uh really inspiring for uh contemporary aestheticians too uh so the problem as i said was uh this anthropomorphic presentation of Christ, Christ in icons, and uh, iconoclast, uh, of course, considered that this should not be the case, that uh, Christ should not be represented in this human form uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, they uh, considered that the only possible uh, image of Christ uh, should be the one which is uh, of the same essence and substance as Christ, that is uh, only bread and wine. Uh, because of course the Christ himself said, uh, and the Holy Scripture testifies to it, that uh, bread and wine in the, in the liturgy today uh, could be considered and should be considered as his um, body and his blood. 
So the only image they would allow of Christ would be exactly this bread and wine, uh, because and this is important. Why? Because they, uh, they idea the understanding of what image what icon is is that icon should be image should be of the same essence and the same substance as the thing it represents so its archetype being represented has the same essence and the same substance as the icon the term is homo sane uh, so the term is Homo, the same, Osea, uh, Osea, Aristoteles term, uh, and this Homo sane term is also to be found in uh, the New Testament uh, uh, as a term describing uh, relations between uh, the father the son and the holy spirit uh, the holy spirit, holy spirit so you may you can imagine how important was uh, this kind of understanding uh, of image for uh, the, the philosophers of the time and also uh, this is a place where we can connect the iconoclastic theory with uh, previous metaphysical uh, understanding of uh, traditional metaphysical understanding of icon that was the first and the main and the most significant point of iconoclasts, uh, which will, of course, be countered by iconodulists, uh, which I will tell you about a bit later. Uh, also, because of this, uh, they uh, were strongly against uh, mimesis as uh, an essence of arts, and they were also against any kind of symbolic or allegorical art uh, in terms of tradition, uh, exemplified with the um, example of lamb I, I mentioned before. What they did, in fact, they uh, suggested that uh, artists practices so uh, painters uh, and uh, adoration of churches should be symbolical but uh, in terms of directly symbolizing uh, truths of faith and uh, and the spiritual realm as itself so uh, they advocated for ornaments they advocated for plants and animals being painted uh, on the walls of the church and also uh, and this is really important they advocated for the verses of the holy scripture uh, to be painted on the walls of the churches uh, in of course uh, aesthetically pleasing manner because uh, they con they considered uh, these uh, religious truths to be the most beautiful of them all to shine the most light and light is to be connected with beauty here and uh, also uh, because they consider them and i quote here this is their term to be spiritual adoration of uh, our souls and everything else in the world so as you may notice uh, what they st stood for uh, is much similar to practices we today find in islam so uh, the idea here, the background idea, is that nothing material can, in fact, represent or point us to uh, anything spiritual. Uh, that uh, this kind of relation is uh, problematic in so many ways and uh, the most important one from the theological point of view is uh, that they consider that painting an icon of Christ would mean just to paint his human nature. That is, that painting can could only represent a human nature of Christ, which means that uh, by worshipping such icon, we would actually worship Christ as a human being and not as a, uh, as a specific person who has both divine and human nature, which means that we, uh, which is a heresy, of course, in, in these terms. Comparing to that, uh, iconodulists, uh, of course, uh, took entirely another course in uh, th their theory of art. And uh, I should say here that although they debated largely and fiercely, uh, that uh, it seems like they were not listening to each other really, uh, that they were their theories and their arguments were designed uh, from two, two different points of view with, uh, with two entirely different points 
points so that uh, they kind of missed each other in this conversation. Uh, what Icon Idealist tried to prove uh, was uh, the role of uh, material presentation of something spiritual, of spiritual realm, uh, can have, and the, uh, they tried to pinpoint the exact uh, character of this representation of this relation between icon and the archetype between what is uh, what could be seen what could be heard what could be grasped with senses and uh, that part of our reality which cannot be seen or heard or grasped by senses let me just say a few uh, name few names to say a uh, few names uh, of persons who were most prominent in this this party of icon dualists, uh, two of those who really defined the debate were uh, Theodore the Student and uh, Patriarch Nikifor uh, Nikiforos uh, the first. Uh, but uh, I would rather present you uh, not their own positions, but those of John of Damascus and partly of uh, St. Basil the Great, uh, who uh, chronologically uh, were before uh, these two most famous iconodulists, but who really influenced and shaped their positions, and moreover, they shaped what we today understand as icon, especially John of Damascus. John of Damascus uh, started with uh, what was the uh, main point of iconoclast. So uh, I already mentioned that that iconoclast insisted on this uh, same essence and substance, homo sane, of uh, icon and the archetype. So the, the painting, the picture, the image, and uh, on one side, and what was uh, what was what is actually represented by it on the other side so those two had to be in perfect harmony those two actually had to be metaphysically the same for the iconoclast uh, in order for us to even have something like icon. Uh, on the contrary, uh, John of Damascus uh, tried to preserve the vital difference between uh, the icon, the image, and uh, the thing represented, in this case, the architect Christ or one of the saints. Uh, so this difference, uh, this important little metaphysical difference, was more or less... Uh, the point of entire in his philosophy here uh, and uh, he really uh, took a lot of effort to defend this small but very important difference uh, in terms of uh, claiming that icon has to be something metaphysically different from the architect in order to be the icon so exactly the opposite from the iconoclast and uh, and Nietzsche would say this is the shortest shadow, so the smallest possible difference you could possibly have, but the one that really counts. And uh, it counts here because without that kind of difference, uh, then iconoclasts are really, um, they're right, they, they have a point. If you do not introduce such difference here, then you really have to to give up on any kind of art and painting and um, frescoes, etc. If you want to have those, then uh, you have to explain for the difference between artistic works, big artworks, because they are obviously not the Christ himself, uh, and the Christ who you're representing, or the saints, or, or what, whoever you're representing here. Uh, another point here is that you have to explain, and John of Damascus did so, you have to explain what kind of relation uh, is here at work, uh, that is, uh, what kind of relationship is there between icon and the archetype, between the icon of Christ and the Christ himself as the archetype presented. So uh, what he did first, he, uh, the first, uh, the most important thing he did is, uh, was to 
uh, divorce uh, this kind of uh, relation between the icon and what it represents uh, from the Platonistic uh, idea of mimesis. So this is obviously not any uh, icon is not uh, imitating Christ in any uh, way familiar uh, to Plato. So it does not try to capture how Christ looked like. It does not try to capture uh, some kind of um, how to say that uh, his personality. Uh, why? Because uh, the personality, the person of Christ transcends human understanding in, entirely because of his that part of his nature which is divine. This is really interesting, this point was really interesting because uh, later in that uh, seventh council, ecumenical council, which allowed for the worship of icons, uh, the comparison of icon with the portrait was made explicitly. So uh, it was said that uh, when one worships the icon, uh, of course, one does not worship the very material object, the, the picture as such, but uh, one worships uh, the uh, person it stands for in case of uh, icon of Christ. Uh, one worships the Christ, Christ himself, not the icon of Christ, not the material object, but uh, the content of this object, uh, which is spiritual. And uh, the comparison was with uh, a usual portrait of an ordinary person. So uh, Church Father said something like this. Uh, uh, when an artist pa when an artist paints a portrait of an ordinary human being, uh, artist does not try to just copy exactly uh, how does this person looks like, but uh, artist tries to capture the personality, so the, the spiritual, the life uh, behind what. I can see. And uh, in the analogy to portrait uh, icon is also defined here. Uh, back to John of Damascus. Uh, so the way he defines this relation between icon and archetype is uh, really uh, interesting because he defines it as uh, not mimetical, as I said before. So the relation is not mimetic. It's, uh, this is, the icon is not a copy of Christ or the, of the archetype of any kind, uh, but it's a kind of manifestation. So you have a reversed, uh, a reversed view. Uh, if that, uh, if what we're trying to do with painting is to copy what already exists somewhere there, we are then. Uh, kind of using, uh, as Plato would say, a mirror uh, and trying to capture all the uh, all the uh, characteristic of that uh, particular object. But here, object is not there to be seen. We cannot just compare icon with the archetype in the manner we can do that with the portrait of a person. But uh, what happens is that the archetype manifests it itself through the icon. So it shines through the icon and there you have the reverse uh, gesture. This is also something uh, strongly familiar with so-called reversed perspective in uh, icons, in a way uh, icons are made. Uh, so the perspective on icon uh, is uh, exactly the opposite from the one uh, devised and uh, used in uh, Renaissance painting. So if uh, the one uh, in uh, Renaissance painting is um, adjusted to the way we are naturally uh, seeing the world and uh, sort of plays with uh, our optics, um, way we see, way we are naturally seeing the, the, the world around us, uh, the perspective which is uh, characteristic for uh, icon painting is uh, the reversed one. So it belongs to the icon itself, not to the world around us. It belongs, if you like, to another world, to a spiritual world, to uh, uh, another realm, uh, which has its own spatial, spatial uh, uh, network web, and uh, it's, it's uh, constituted differently. And this uh, different constitution of this spiritual realm is what shines through uh, the icons. So uh, when we are 
uh, looking at the icon, we actually are seeing uh, a sort of rupture in our basic reality, a sort of window which uh, allows us to see in another, to see things in uh, entirely another dimension. So, icon is exactly uh, is uh, something like uh, a rupture in our realities, it's the, a, a place like uh, some like someone tore the reality apart at one place, and uh, now the light shines through that that crack uh, which icon is, and uh, we can see things differently. Uh, of course, because this is the spiritual reality connected with our reality, we can see in consequence, we can uh, see our own reality in this new light, and uh, in this uh, more true light. Uh, here, one could, uh, if if we put these uh, religious aspects uh, aside, uh, we can com we could compare that, and that would be my suggestion to you, uh, compare that to um, non-figurative uh, abstract painting of 20th century in terms of not representing anything here and uh, uh, anything which is uh, mm, object of our material reality, but sort of making a, another rupture in the reality, allowing us to see another real, realm in uh, the painting itself. So the very frame of the painting should be understood as as the uh, borderline between two worlds, if you would like to, to put it that way. So uh, all of this, of course, leads us to the main point of uh, Icon of Duelists, and that would be the following. Uh, the main role and the uh, entire point with Icon of Painting is uh, on the side of epistemology. So their uh, function is to make us understand more than make us enjoy. Although all icon dualists more or less talked about uh, this uh, specific aesthetic pleasure, this specific uh, feature of aesthetic experience of icons, frescoes, and so on, uh, as something uh, which marks them, as something which um, makes them what they, they are as something uh, which uh, help us uh, in uh, experiencing this these uh, objects uh, in their nature, in their essence. Uh, the, the focus and the emphasis is not on the aesthetic pleasure, but uh, on the uh, on the um, epistemological side of it. And the point here would be that uh, uh, what is not seen, what is spiritual, the entire realm uh, which uh, we would place uh, God and Christ and saints to, uh, and our immaterial soul to, uh, is something to be revealed through material objects, and in this case, through material objects such as uh, artworks. So, uh, artworks uh, actually function as a means of learning to see the world uh, with another pair of eyes, to see the world from a different perspective, and this is exactly the point with the reverse perspective. The, the perspective is reversed in order, in, in the very icon, uh, in order to make us uh, learn to see things differently. So it's more like uh, uh, the icon watches and looks at us and then we are glancing back at the icon as a sort of answer on this look uh, which was um, pointed at us from within the icon. It's more like that than just, uh, it's more like a, a medium of uh, communicating with uh, another person than a matter of aesthetically uh, experiencing a kind of object. So everything material is here uh, put aside, and this kind of epistemological uh, uh, significance of uh, icons is also uh, strongly, uh, strongly advocated by Saint Basil the Great. Uh, both Saint Basil the Great and uh, John of Damascus uh, said the famous, uh, claimed the same famous line that uh, frescoes and icons are. Um, a sort of uh, holy scriptures for those who are illiterate, for those who cannot read, who do not know how to read. And uh, we, if we take this line uh, literally, then 
we could say, well, yes, uh, Christian society of the time was uh, surely uh, consisted surely more of those people who had no chance to really read the scripture and to learn about the Christian truths from the uh, Holy Scripture as such, uh, more more illiterate than the literate one, more uh, uneducated one than the, those who were educated, uh, in fact. But the point is uh, a bit different here. Uh, not just that, uh, but uh, the point is that uh, these visual, these um, visual images are supporting the uh, verbal statements, the uh, truths of the Holy Scriptures, so that human being could use uh, both his material and spiritual side, both his rational mind and his senses in his quest for the divine truth and his quest for the communication and the worshipping of uh, God. So uh, similar as with uh, Christ and uh, his uh, dual nature, divine and uh, human one, also human being has a sort of dual nature, has a spiritual uh, nature in terms of his soul, immortal soul, and this material nature uh, in terms of knowledge. Uh, the first one is represented by, of course, our reason, and the second one by our senses. But uh, in the Byzantine philosophy from the very early ages, there was a significant tradition of questioning the um, possibilities of human reason to acquire any knowledge about uh, God and uh, the very nature of reality he stands for, uh, which is most known and also was influential in uh, Western countries uh, in by the works of um, Pseudo-Dionysus, the Areopagite. And uh, this tradition of uh, being skeptical about reason and discursive uh, possibilities of knowledge uh, when it comes to the very fundamental issues of our reality now uh, had in Iconodulus theory of icon uh, gain uh, a new new turn, new uh, and positive turn. Uh, it now meant that we can use our senses and our aesthetic experience to compensate uh, reason and uh, this kind of uh, inability of reason to uh, to address the the, the God and, and the very fundamentals of our world as such. This, of course, does not mean that by uh, combining the reason and uh, our senses, that is our static experience, we will finally come to the full knowledge of God and uh, our material role in, in the nature of our material reality, uh, because that would not be possible without uh, the grace and the help from above, the help from God. But still, this makes it Quite interestingly, uh, this makes um, aesthetic issues and our sensitivity and aesthetic, aesthetic experience equal to the workings of reason and uh, equal in terms of knowledge, which is what reason should do. So uh, in those terms, icons are considered, and frescoes, of course, are considered to be uh, uh, as as this uh, seventh uh, ecumenical council father said, uh, an interpretation of holy scripture of uh, the, the very. Um, what I want to say is that the very uh, painting is an interpretation. It's not that I'm interpreting painting and that uh, while watching it and that, that my, uh, my interpretation, then I combine it with something I know from the Holy Scripture from before. It's that it, the very icon is the very interpretation of the um of the uh, truths of faith uh, in the very same way, if not even better than uh, interpretations we can do with our reason. And this was the main point, and this uh, more or less remained the main point with icons uh, in uh, Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox tradition. So uh, we are kind of with both sides of our being, we are trying to uh, uh, do the impossible, to communicate, and to worship and to love God uh, as we should and uh, as it was prescribed. Uh, 
and um I would like to finish this uh, small, and this was really brief and small. Um, I, I could talk about this for hours, and I believe this really requires uh, quite a lot of time. My cat again. Just a sec. Uh, so I would like to um, kind of conclude this uh, with an example of what we are left with, and how did it all develop uh, later. So please... Uh, Behold, this is one of icons in my possession. Uh, this is icon of Our Lady, uh, obviously, and uh, I really appreciate it, although uh, it's probably um, not the best ever you could find, but uh, in terms of my, my personal gains, it's really nice. Uh, I really like this icon. So uh, what I wanted to show you is the following. Many of these ideas I've mentioned uh, during the presentations are to be seen in this icon here, which was made some 10 years ago here in Serbia by a person close to me at the time. So uh, it's allowed. Uh, the issues and the conclusions and the concerns are very much defining the practice of artists today. So first of all, take a look. There is no shadow here so no shadow at all is ever represented on icon uh, because the light which is presented here comes from another realm as i said because light which is presented here is not earthly light we all have chance to see and uh, through which we see material object this light comes from above it's a spiritual light and it's omnipresent as uh, God is omnipresent, so there is no place on earth uh, which is not shunned upon by this light. Therefore, no shadows. There is no shadow here and never will be. Uh, take note about this. So I will make it a bit closer. Inscription. Inscription. Uh, same here, Matya Teu that is uh, Mother of, of God, and this is called the title uh, of the icon. And uh, this title of icon is not just its name, although it is also its name, so it, it names uh, the archetype presented, uh, but it's also important in terms of if you don't have uh, this title written on the uh, icon, then it does not count as an icon. So an icon, in order to be an icon, has to have this inscription, has to have, note that, uh, verbal signs combined with nonverbal signs. And both of those are pointing and referring to the same direction. So we have here a harmony between verbal and nonverbal signs, and this is something very characteristic for uh, Middle Ages and especially for icon making. So uh, in terms of what I said before, uh, uh, so this would represent, the, the letters would represent uh, verbal and of course a rational discursive thinking so reason while this all everything else represents um, our aesthetic experience our artistic skill and uh, they are both in harmony they are combined together working together uh, at the same time so this is something that will uh, not be the case with renaissance or modern painting but still here it's it, it is the case because uh, both of these semiotically different field uh, fields nonverbal and verbal signs are uh, considered to be able to do the same or not to be able to do the same so uh, what i want to say is that uh, uh, nonverbal signs are uh, not uh, in any in, 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 
they are in, in exactly the same position as the verbal signs as well as the static uh, experience is uh, exactly in the same position as the uh, rational thinking when it comes to the very fundamentals of our reality uh, there are also things that i wanted to stress here uh, that all of this uh, you, you can hear me saying uh, signs non-verbal signs verbal signs and so on uh, so uh, the point is that all of this is in fact a sign uh, not really a symbol in those terms we mentioned before but more like signs uh, in terms of uh, making explicit making manifest something uh, which transcends the very material object as it is and also uh, although it's all sign everything here is also a symbol so there is not a one single piece or detail on this icon which uh, has uh, no symbolical meaning everything from the colors to the uh, to the way it was presenting to the letters and everything else everything has its symbolical meaning uh, for example um, this golden coating on the icon uh, represent the divine truth although it also shines a light as you can see uh, the point is that this is representative of the divine truth and the icons are covered in gold not because this makes them more precious and uh, uh, more flamboyant or whatever but because um, byzantine um, philosophers and the theologians uh, were of opinion that gold does not change in time so it's everlasting like the divine truth is also the colors uh, if you would for example consider an icon of christ and uh, the colors of his robe uh, the color the red color of his robe uh, is um, a symbol of his divine nature while the blue color on his robe is a symbol of his human nature um, also the way you make the icon not just the elements uh, we can see when the icon is finished but the very process of making it is also uh, a matter of um, full of symbolical meaning and you have to do it symbolically of course you have to pray and you have to have uh, a sort of uh, a blessing to do it but nevertheless the, the whole entire process is significant you start with uh, gathering painting and making your colors making your paintings paints uh, colors for painting uh, you do that by uh, gathering herbs and minerals so they have to be of natural origin then you mix it with elk yolk and some water and some vinegar so you you have to in, you have to make uh, the means to make the icon uh, using what nature gave you that is what already exists what already is uh, made by God so you kind of already including the God divine presence in what you are making as an artist and this corresponds to uh, early Christian uh, early Byzantine ideas of beauty and art too because uh, it was a common place in early centuries of uh, Christian philosophy to consider uh, God as uh, the main artist of them all so the first and the best and the greatest artists and of course his work of art is the world and not just that but to emphasize the beauty of this world as a work of art uh, uh, to uh, make a point that it was uh, made by uh, by God on purpose so that it has a creator who made this world on purpose that it was not just a, a product of some kind of uh, you know, chance also when you're making an icon and using those kind of colors uh, you make them so that you start from the background which is in dark colors and you progress to lighter colors even to the white one i'm not sure if you can see that in the video but uh, there is also nuances of lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter color even to the white one here uh, on this icon and the idea is uh, that the uh, the archetype as i told you shines through the icon so it manifests itself through the icon inviting 
uh, us back, to look back and to participate in this sort of uh, uh, aesthetically opened uh, dialogue and relation with what with another with another person with a uh, divine person uh, at the end of it all. So uh, many other things are to be explained here. I really don't think I should proceed with that, uh, at least not now. And uh, what I wish to say here is, um, what I wish to conclude here uh, with uh, is another small point. I was kind of uh, uh, pointing to that direction all the time, but I would like to make that explicit now. So. Uh, uh, dealing with medieval aesthetics is not something to be taken for granted uh, because there are um, there is a famous debate uh, often associated with the name of Umberto Eco uh, regarding whether or not we should use the term aesthetics for anything uh, any kind of um, theory of art or beauty or whatever in those terms uh, before modern times because as we all know it was Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten in the 18th century who coined the word and the, uh, made, made aesthetics uh, a specific field in philosophy, specific discipline in philosophy. So uh, regardless of that, uh, I believe that we should not disregard the fact that uh, Middle Ages did not only give us uh, amazing works of art, but also uh, Middle Ages gave us uh, specific and refined theories about art and about beauty and many other aesthetic categories or those categories we would today call aesthetic. And uh, we can learn from this uh, if we are ready to, um, well, uh, think about the issues we are concerned today uh, in a different manner. What I'm saying here is not uh, that we should um, merely mimic or copy or just repeat what uh, Middle Ages uh, philosophy, middle, medieval philosophers uh, used to say, but um, something rather different. Uh, I'm aiming here at this, the following point. Uh, today, aesthetics and philosophy of art is uh, greatly defined by uh, the way uh, modern philosophers uh, posed questions uh, about uh, aesthetics and uh, uh, about beauty and arts and, and similar issues and uh, we today are whether we are whether we are um, aware of that or not uh, often more often they're not uh, under the impression of these theories and uh, mostly under the uh, influence of uh, the way they are thinking about art, not just what they said, but how did they think about art and artworks and beauty and so on. Uh, this can find, um, this can be countered by uh, searching for uh, other approaches to art and we we can learn from those approaches in terms of uh, taking another point of view. It can be, for example, uh, I don't know, Chinese or um, Japanese or Korean aesthetics, if you prefer that approach. But it also can be medieval one, if you preferred it. And uh, in my experience, and I believe uh, Bitter shares my opinion here, uh, mm, Medieval philosophy and especially medieval take on uh, philosophy of art uh, or on art issues uh, is a treasure box uh, still not discovered uh, as it should be and uh, still um, still full of many, many treasures to be discovered. So that would be the way I would like to look at it. And this is something I would like to left you with. Uh, if um, there are any 
questions about this if you're interested in this topic more because this this really was the only sketch i could uh, that we, we would need much more time to explain in detail uh, many of things that i mentioned and many more which i didn't even have a chance to mention um, please be free to contact me you can google my name or you can just ask twitter to give you my email um, and um, finally I hope you at least found uh, some of these issues interesting. Um, again, and this would really be my final word on it, Richard, thank you again for making all of this possible and uh, coming up with such a wonderful idea. Thank you. Bye.